There's an old prophet who has gone to the house of a man who is known to have some fine sons, some good-looking boys in his house, and the old prophet has been sent by God to his house to find a new leader, a new king, a new potentate to lead the people of God, the children of Israel. Saul has somehow, like my daddy used to say all the time, just before he punished me, had, had torn his britches, uh, with the Lord, so to speak, because God had given him a commandment, had told him what to do, and he had arrogantly, subjectively decided to alter those commandments and do what he wanted to do instead. And of course, like many folks do when they have disobeyed God, when they have failed to keep his commandments to the letter and do exactly what he has commanded for them to do, he had an excuse. Well, the, the people wanted me to do it, and you know, I thought it would be good for us if the people had what they wanted. And the people wanted us to keep old Agag alive. It, it looked good to come back in a march of victory with old King Agag in shackles and with the spoils of their great kingdom. It just made us look good, God. It really did. And I, I, just, made a, I just made an executive decision to change your commandments. How often do we hear leaders in the Lord's church, leaders in politics, leaders in academia, who make executive decisions that go against everything that we stand for, everything that we believe, against the very nature and culture of our people. And this is exactly what Saul had done. God decided to replace him. Let him know that you, I'm cutting your lineage off right now. You won't go another further. It stops right here. And your sons will not succeed you to the throne. So God sent the prophet up to Jesse's house, and he's looking at Jesse's boys. And, and you've heard the story before. Your fine preacher has preached this, and your fine elders have taught it. And I know you do, I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. But he brought one boy before him, and he said, God says, no, that, uh, I don't like that one. That's not the one. He brought another one, just as pretty as the other one. And the guy said, no, don't want, don't want him either. I don't want that one either. And he continued to bring a succession of his boys. And the old prophet got a little huffy because, you know, God, you know, I'm looking at these boys. These are some fine looking boys, God. Well, you know, why in the world would you not want any of them? Can't you see them riding down the streets of Israel in their Cadillac chariot with their hair blowing in the wind? They would make us look good. God says, I don't want them and basically had to rebuke the old prophet and put him back in his place. Well, once he kind of got his uh, ego in check and got humble like God wanted him, he went to Jesse and said, do you have any other boys? And Jesse said, yeah, I got one more boy. His name is David. He's up, if you let me paraphrase, he's up there uh, watching the sheep, playing his guitar up there with the sheep and uh, sitting up on the hill. And he went up there and God said, that's the one. And I'm sure that, that uh, uh, the old prophet Samuel, like many of us, looking on things that we consider to be important in a leader, the things that we consider to be pertinent and relevant, those things which are attractive to us in, in a leader. And God says, you know, you, man, looks on the outward appearance. God says, I look at the heart. And God didn't choose David because he was the best looking of Jesse's boys or the tallest. As a matter of fact, the scriptures called him ruddy. But David said, I've killed a bear and I've killed a lion. Basically, God saw a heart of courage and strength and stamina and steadfastness in David and a heart that loved God first with all of his personal issues and personal failures. God knew that this is a young man that will love me better than Saul loved me. When John received that letter, 
that God gave to the Lord and the Lord gave to the messenger, the angel to take to John to send to the seven churches of Roman Asia Minor on the imperial postal route. And as that letter circulated, each of the letters to each congregation is prefaced by speaking to the leaders, the angels of those churches. Because all of the ills, even those things that were good, and those things that were weak and lacking, and in, as far as the church is Sardis, those things that are weak and about to die, you've got a name that's alive, but you're dead. I'm looking within. God says everybody else say you're doing fine, but I'm looking at you. I'm looking at your heart the same way I looked at David's heart. And he says you've got a name that's alive, but you are dead. And basically God said to the leaders of that church, you need to strengthen, you need to change your attention. You need to put your attention on those that are willing to stand, those who are willing to speak, those who have not soiled their garments, those who are still loyal to me. You need to strengthen those things that remain. And tonight to the leaders of the Lord's church that are here and the leaders of the Lord's church in the brotherhood, as we try to make our stand in a very, very difficult time in our history as Americans and a difficult time in the history of a world that's turning to atheism, secular humanism, modernism, and all other types of isms that we must lead. And so this lesson tonight, we need to strengthen our leaders. And as our leaders are strengthened, our followers will also be strengthened. I pray to God that he will look down upon us in his tender mercy and his love as we study his word. Let us pray. Merciful God, this day we stand before your people, the best people in the world. It is our prayer, Father, that we say those things that are pleasing to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. One time the Lord said in the book of Matthew chapter 15, as he is teaching, and we know the Lord was the master teacher, and his parables were taken from those things that people understood. The Lord never tried to be so profound and so deep that he went over people's head. I mean, he's the son of God. He knows everything. He is before time. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and omnipresent. But Jesus spoke in such a way that men could understand. This is why, as we said this morning, that the common people heard him gladly because he didn't speak as the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't speak from tradition and arrogance and ego, but Jesus talked to the people and not at the people. And he told them those things that strengthened them and lift them up and made them believe that there was a God that cared about them more than they cared about themselves. My goodness, what, what a wonderful day it would have been to sit there and listen to Jesus on that mountain as he gave that greatest sermon that was ever preached that taught us the true blessings of happiness, of following and loving and obeying a God who loved us first. And for this reason, in the book of Matthew chapter 15 and verses 14, the Lord said, if the blind be leaders of the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. On one occasion, the, the apostles came to the Lord after one of his fiery lessons, and Jesus said it and called it like it was. He didn't bite his tongue. He was never mean, but he was always direct because he wanted men to be saved. The Lord was not trying to condemn men. He was not trying to simply put them down or expose them. He was trying to save them, to alter them, to change them, to convert them to reprove them, rebuke them, and to find a resolution to those things that were causing them to do wrong. So the Lord had preached one of his lessons, and the apostles, like many leaders that I have met on too many occasions, they came to the Lord and said, Lord, Lord, uh, Lord, uh, you were kind of rough there, weren't you, Lord? Uh, Lord, you know, you spoke quite, uh, yeah, you know, Lord, you, you, you could have eased up just a little bit. Lord, you hurt their feelings. They were offended by your lesson. You ever had people in the Lord's church come to the leaders, the elders, the deacons, the preachers, and say, you know, y'all preaching kind of hard around here. Y'all, you're kind of making some strong stands around here. 
And I've had folks come to me after lessons and say, well, you know, brother, that was, that was kind of tough. I said, was it the Bible? Well, yeah, it was the Bible. I said, was it the truth? Well, yeah, it was the truth. I said, did it come from the Word of God? Well, yeah, it came from the Word of God, but it was just hard. Well, I said, you know, that's just kind of what the Bible is. The Bible just calls it. It's that mirror that allows you to see and understand who you are. Because God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are as far above your thoughts as the heavens are above the earth. If you go to the Hebrew, that word thoughts right there means strategy. God is basically saying the way you look at things and the way I look at things are totally, completely different because my vantage point is as far above yours as the heavens are above the earth. So the apostles say, Lord, you, you hurt their feelings. You, you really hurt their feelings. The Lord said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. The Lord then apologized. I said, what do you think I ought to say, fellas? You think I need to change the lesson a little bit? You think I need to hold off on some of those virtues? You think I need to, to ease off on telling them to be obedient to God? You think I need to kind of lay back on the scripture a little bit and give a little bit more funny stories and a few more traditions? What do you think I need to do, fellas? The Lord didn't do that. The Lord said, leave them alone. Basically, he said, get out of my face. Leave them alone, he said. They are blind and they are leaders of the blind. And if the blind be leaders of the blind, the Lord said they both fall into the ditch. The Lord's trying to prevent those following blind leaders from falling into the ditch. And those leaders of the Lord who truly pick up the mantle and, uh, and find the strength to do what God wants them to do, you're doing the same exact thing because there are so many of these spiritual and religious pie pipers that are leading folks down a road of false doctrine, of false ways and mediocrity, and that they fall into the ditch. You see, the, the bottom line is this. God wants every one of us to understand something. God's not going to compromise his law to fit our moral condition. God's not going to change it. He's not going to alter it. He's not going to update it. He's not going to amend it. He's not going to call a caucus for us to vote on it. And basically what God says is every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Every system, every thought, every law, every way, every direction that my heavenly Father has not given, Lord says I'm going to pull it up. And you know in an agrarian state like the state of Tennessee, we understand because in the days of picking cotton and chopping cotton, you might chop the top off of a, off of a piece of Johnson grass, but if you grab that bad boy and pull him up and shake the dirt off of him and lay him over in the sun, he's not coming back. The roots, he might come back, but when you pull him up, the Lord said, I'm going to root this stuff up. I'm going to root it up. He says, every system and doctrine that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. We as God's leaders, those men in this, this room who lead the Lord's church, those women who are married to them, those who work with them, those who lead the young women and teach the children, all of you should understand your awesome responsibility because when the church at Sardis is addressed by that letter that was sent by John, when he finally got to that particular city, as he went around the postal route, what the Lord wanted them to understand is your works, I don't find your works perfect or complete. There are some things you need to give attention to. There are some things that you've been turning your back on, some things that you didn't speak up when you should have spoken up. When, pa when Paul came and Peter had been eating and sitting and enjoying the Gentile brethren, those converts to the Lord's church who at one time been in heathenous and idolatrous uh, religions that did not recognize God, but they've been converted by the word of God. And the Bible lets me know that Peter sat there with them, but when others of his close friends and folks who were orthodox, who, who knew him, he got up and he walked away. The Bible says, Paul said, I withstood him. I withstood him to his face, Paul said, because he was to be blamed. If we had more men who would develop the backbone, 
Straighten up their shoulders, straighten up their eyes, look men dead eyeball to eyeball and tell them when they're wrong. A lot of the issues that we have in the church would disappear because folks would understand that they're not going to be tolerated. When we start compromising, as I said this morning, and capitulating and going along to get along and not rocking the boat and not shaking the tree and, well, you know, it's a different time and a different way. Well, you know, we may have changed, but God didn't change. We may have compromised, but God does not compromise. The Lord said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, my word shall not pass away. The Lord said, if I... If I be lifted up, what are you talking about? If my word, my way, my doctrine, my teaching, my pattern, my example, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Too many of us are trying to draw folks by our personalities and by our intuitiveness and by our uh, 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 um, um, the fact being magnetic and whatever it is we call ourselves being. But the Lord says, you're not the show, I'm the show. I'm the show. You're not the draw, I'm the draw. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And for this reason, those leaders in the church at Sardis were told, listen, brethren, as God gave the message to Jesus, Jesus to the angel who delivered it to John, who sent it on the postal route, to the seven churches in Roman Asia Minor, each of them having a different issue, commendation, or condemnation that had to be said in perpetuity for the church to examine itself. The apocalypse, that book of Revelation, those lessons are there to make us look within. You know, many of us have taken pictures, I know I have, and folks will shoot a picture and they'll show it to me and I'll say, hey, that's not me. And, you know, and they say, yes, it is. I say, no, that's not me. But it is me. It's just from a perspective that I don't care for. It's from an angle. It shows a side or something that I don't like, that, that I don't care for. But it is me. And too many of us, when the Word of God does a snapshot of us, of our service, of our career as Christians, of our congregations, of our leaders, of our followers, of our children, of our families, we'll say, that's not me, that's not me. But God was telling the seven churches, sending them a snapshot, saying, these are the issues that y'all need to deal with. And the church at Sardis was told, you strengthen those things that remain. The men and women that are in this room are obviously God's people. You are obviously in love with the Lord. You obviously love to worship. You obviously love the Word of God. You are obviously trying to go to heaven. Don't you realize that we spend so much time on folks who will never, ever read, quote, or love a Bible verse while we lose those that give every fiber of their being to the Lord? What, what the writer is saying to the church at Sardis, you need to concentrate your time on those that remain. You need to make sure that the young men and women in your congregation have an understanding of God's word of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. You need to make sure that those who are older and senior who have been on the battlefield for years and they wear the crown, the hoary head, crown of white hair, because of all the years they put into service, you need to put your attention on them. You need to put your attention on those sound gospel preachers who will stand and preach the word of God, not make up what they want to say, but preach it without addition or subtraction. You need to put your attention on those elders who will stand forthright on those things that are written and not buckle and break just because of the pressure from those who want things to change that God absolutely does not want to change. Basically what he says, you need to strengthen those things that remain. And we need to strengthen our leaders. Our leaders need to be strong, they need to be wise, and they need to understand that God has placed his people in their hands. For those who sit here, Solomon in his wisdom, as he wrote the book of Proverbs, Solomon said something in Proverbs chapter 1 and verses 7. 
which every leader should make as an anthem in their mind of their service and their commitment to the Lord, and then commit that also to others. Solomon said the fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Solomon says reverential awe it is the principal initiation of wisdom. And it, from there, there is a short journey to understanding. When there is awe of God's word, I've been preaching almost 50 years. My daddy preached almost 60. I have two brothers who preach. Both of them are elders in the church and preachers in the church. But every time I sit down to prepare a lesson, I'm in awe because I've never studied and not found something I didn't, that I didn't know. I've never gone deep into the scripture where I didn't get a better understanding of something I thought I understood. I've never let God talk to me where it didn't give peace to my soul and strength in my walk and make me lift up my eyes with the type of spiritual assurance of knowing that God loves me even better than I love myself. That's why Solomon said that, that, that the fear of the Lord, when you have reverential awe of the Lord, those men who lead in the church, when you have reverential awe of the Lord's word, of his power, of his majesty, that is the beginning of wisdom that profits the whole church. Everybody profits from your wisdom because of the way that you love the Lord. When, when Solomon wrote this, it strengthens and gives us wisdom just as it did thousands of years ago because wisdom spoke to Solomon and Solomon said, this is what wisdom said to me. Wisdom said, I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst and the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. When you find a man of substance, not just because of what he has learned professionally, but what he has learned spiritually from the word of God. When you find a man that is filled with God's word, that loves God's word, his wisdom will captivate the whole church and everyone that knows him to try to be a better person and live as God would have them to live. And this is why the Apostle Paul gave Timothy a stern warning about those who work against wisdom. And we have those, unfortunately, that work against the wisdom of the Word, work against the Word of God, work against those men who stand on those things that are written. And when Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 15, Paul went on in his thesis to say this, he says, under God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But then he continued in his teaching and in his admonition. And in verses 16, Paul said, But shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. There are some brethren I have had, we've had them down at Coleman. So the brethren don't mind me talking about Coleman as an example. And they want to talk on and on and on and babble on and on and on and wrestle on and on and on about something that has absolutely no importance in the salvation of God's people or the strength of the Lord's church. But they got some, some bird, some hobby, something that bugs them. And they want us to spend all of our time on it at a certain point I tell the brethren, I had to tell the brother, I'll tell you what, brother, let's just agree to disagree. And basically, a nice way of saying, you get out of my face because I'm tired of talking to you. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, shun them. Shun them. There are folks who get you all tied up in worthless arguments, got the leaders tied up in a bunch of stuff when God has already spoken. You say what God told you to say. And let that be that and, and, and call a spade a spade and move on to the important stuff of strengthening those things that remain. 
You see, the devil wants to weaken us. If he can get us fighting, you got 200 people and therefore you got 200 agendas and 200 opinions and 200 gripes and 200 of this, that, and the other. How in the world are you going to preach the gospel? So at some point you let the word of God have its way in the life of men. And if, if those who lead, if we're going to be strong, they have to watch, and they watch once they get an understanding. In Proverbs chapter 4, beginning at verses 5 and continuing through verses 7, Solomon said a long time ago, Solomon said, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline uh, her words uh, from thy mouth, forsake her not, and she will preserve thee. Love her, and she will keep thee. And he went on to say, wisdom is the principal thing, but in all of thy getting, get an understanding. Therefore, get wisdom, but in all of your getting, get an understanding. God wants his leaders to have an understanding, and they, they know what God wants them to know. My mama used to tell me, because I just knew I knew everything, um, you know, I had passed in the sixth grade, therefore I am accomplished in all the things of this world. And my mama would let me know real quick. And she would get in my face and say, Nick, she called me Nick. She said, Nick, there's enough you don't know to make a whole new world. Now, that's, uh, you know, that puts you pretty much down in your place, don't it? If there's enough I don't know to make a whole new world. When we think about us and our finite knowledge compared to God's infinite knowledge, I don't ever put my opinion, my thoughts, my vantage point, my viewpoint, my intelligence, my intuitiveness, my agenda, agenda in front of what God expressly told me to say and do. I say and do what God told me to say and do. I use intelligence. I mean, that's a right time to say the right thing. That's a wrong time to say the right thing. I use common sense to do that. But I always realize that it is not what I want, but it's what God wants that I've got to do. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 1 and verses 5, he said, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. And basically what he says, a person who is wise will continue to get wiser. I've had folks say, well, you know, y'all are not perfect. Y'all are leaders. Y'all may be an elder. You may be a preacher, but you're not perfect. Y'all aren't perfect. And I've had, I've, and I've, I bet you a dollar against a bullfrog, like Papa Stalin used to say, that a whole lot of y'all leaders in this room have had folks who are going to come and give you their diagnosis of your character. You're not perfect. And I get, now you know, at a certain point in time, I, I kind of tell them, you're right, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as imperfect as you are. And, you know, that, and I, I get them out of my face after a certain point. It's only so long you can listen to that that kind of foolishness before you got to put folks in their place. And basically what God wants us to do as leaders is make sure that our perfection is not based on our opinion of ourselves, that our perfection or our completeness is based on how well we're following the example of Jesus Christ and the pattern of our leader. Because if he's going to make you the leader you need to be so you can strengthen that which remains, so that you can watch out for God's people, so that you can lift up the downtrodden, so that you can save the least, the last, the little, and the lost like he sent you to do, then we've got to follow the example of the one person who got it right. Jesus is the only one who got it right, who knew no sin, Neither was there gal found in his mouth. And you know, for this reason, you look for men who want to get better and want to get wise. But you know, some, they used to say, you can, put, you can put a racing saddle on a donkey, but you still don't have a racehorse. And basically, you know, you've got to find men who meet the qualifications. And when they meet those qualifications and they are ordained, then you follow them, you support them, you uphold them. You be there to be strengthened by them, and you strengthen them. You pray for them. You ask God to be around them and clothe them in wisdom and good judgment. Why? Because they lead. And I, I tell my brothers all the time when they'll call me, we get on a three-way, 
And I have Edward is in Charlotte and Tony is there in Memphis with me and we're on and they're just going on about the problems in the church and how somebody said this and somebody did that. And I, I listen for a while. And you know, I'm the old guy in the family. I say, fellas, if it was easy, anybody could do it. And so basically, you know, what God wants us to know, it's not going to be easy. That's why he gave those qualifications. And that's why you take the time. And as Paul said, lay hands suddenly on no man. You find those that you are willing to follow and those who are willing to follow the Lord. So, you know, brothers and sisters, our brethren at Corinth one time were criticized for their dependence upon man. There are those who are looking at the political leaders and the corporate leaders and the academia leaders and the medical community leaders and all other type of leaders. And they're looking to them rather than looking to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 20. The Apostle Paul asks a very simple question. Where is the wise? Where are all these smart people you're talking about? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? He, and then Paul basically put it in place. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Basically, hasn't God shown over and over and over that the, that the, the wisdom of man and the opinion of man has no substance. He said, who is it among you that dispute and debate with God and has the ability to debate with God? So leaders, as leaders in the Lord's church, you always have to be kind and gentle because those are qualifications. You always have to be hospitable and love good men because those are qualifications. But you know something? At the same time, God expects you to exemplify strength of character, determination of your understanding of the word of God and that you are steadfast and unmovable in those things that are written. You see, everybody's got an opinion. You got an opinion. I got an opinion. All God's children got an opinion. Problem is, I meet with a whole bunch of brethren who have an opinion, but they don't have an argument. When it's time to support their opinion, they can't support it, but they got an opinion. And they can tell you their opinion. I said, based on what, brother? Well, uh, I just believe. But, you know, who made you the authority? At the end of the day, it's what God's word says. And that's what leaders in the Lord's church, if we're going to strengthen that which remains, if we're going to strengthen beautiful congregations like those that are represented here tonight, if we're going to lift up men and women who are willing to give their time, their talent and treasure to the Lord, then those leaders in the Lord's church have to find their wisdom in the word of God. Even Paul, an inspired writer in the New Testament, an apostle with the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, he said, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power. In other words, Paul says, I didn't try to look pretty to you. And I didn't try to make it pretty to you. I just told you what God had to say. So therefore, as leaders, strengthen those things that remain. And the only way you're going to do this is by going to the word of God and letting it give you the right direction, the right teaching, the right answers, the right character, the wisdom that will make you the type of men that folks will follow. The right answers will often elude us. Those things that we need to know will often elude us. We've got a lot of brethren right now who have indifferent investigation, rusty reasoning, lazy logic, stagnant studies, and eccentric exegesis. We have those who think they know and they don't know. They scream loud. They style, smile, and profile in the pulpit. They stomp, spit, and shout all over the brotherhood. But they're only saying those things that lead people toward that ditch that the Lord put you to stand in front of that ditch and save folks from the ditch. That's your job. Your job is to get folks to heaven. Get them to heaven. The Lord says, I want you to get my people to heaven. That's why I call you a shepherd. A shepherd's understood that a sheep, sheep didn't have fangs, they didn't have sharp teeth. They don't have hide. They don't have wings. They don't have claws. Sheep have no defensive. You know, a few of the rams have horns, but a sheep is basically a meal on wheels. 
That's why he needs a shepherd to watch out for him. And the Lord wants those men in the Lord's church to understand, your job is to get my people safely home. Get them safely home. You're not, it's not a populist job. Folks are not going to like you always. They're not going to always encourage you. They're not always going to appreciate you. Don't you know something? I did not appreciate my mama. I, I've talked about my mama's switch many times. That switch would turn corners. That thing had radar. You couldn't run from that thing. And you know, I, we wondered sometime if our daddy understood that that beautiful, soft-spoken, tea cake and cake-making woman that he married, when he wasn't there, could turn into a fiery-eyed demon who could fly through the house. We wondered if he knew that. We, you know, we tried to tell him just in case he didn't know. But don't you understand something that my mama, when she, what I did not appreciate a lot of the things that I was told, that I was taught, the times that I was punished, the time that I was disciplined, the time that my daddy would stand me and look me in my face with his nose almost touching mine, looking me dead in my eye and telling me what will and will not be in his house. I didn't appreciate it at the time. But don't you know the man that I am today that can stand here at this wonderful congregation and stand in this pulpit and preach the gospel if they had not done that, if they had not done that, if they had not stopped me in my tracks many times when I thought I knew something, if my daddy hadn't caught me in a lie one day and said, boy, he said, that's one of those, I remember I told you about the round lie. He said, boy, you don't know where that lie starts and you don't know where that lie ends. Don't you know, if they had not done that, then I wouldn't be the man that I am today. This is why God puts leaders in the Lord's church. He wants those men and those women who support them and those women who do what they've been commanded by the scriptures to do, to have the courage and the strength to stand when everybody else compromises, when everybody else walks away, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10 and 23 that every one of you can quote, Jeremiah said, oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So let me tell you this before I sit down uh, this evening. Solomon, who was the laboratory of human experience, when he wrote the book of Proverbs, this boy had messed up more than anybody because he had more stuff than anybody. He had more gold, more silver, more horses, more houses, more swimming pools, more women. He had more substance and stuff than anybody who had ever lived as God gave it to him. God said there would never be one like you before you. There would never be one like you after you. But Solomon, the, the laboratory of human experience, Solomon, who did all these things, Solomon says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. What is he saying? Basically, when I get through and finish and complete the fulfilling of the flesh, as I said this morning, as John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And the Lord said it like this. Now that we understand the world, the Lord said, What has it profited a man if he gains the whole world? What's the whole world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. What does he profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Lord, so what have you profited? You got all this stuff, but you lost yourself. You got a car that goes from corner to corner, but you lost yourself. You've got an office so big that you need a go-kart to get around inside of it, but you lost yourself. You've got so much money that you've got to hire people to count it, but you lost yourself. You're such a star, you're so beautiful, you're so talented, you're so popular that you can't walk and everybody on the planet know you by your first name, but you lost yourself. He says, what have you profited? What have you profited? The Lord said, you got all this stuff, but you lost yourself. That's why God put shepherds in the church, because he doesn't want folks losing themselves. He don't want little boys leaving here as song leaders and coming back as somebody that you don't recognize. 
He don't want little girls leaving here looking virtuous and modest and happy and kind and coming back somebody that you're ashamed of. He don't want homes breaking apart because they've allowed the internet and the television and the movie stars and the rap stars. And we listen to all these people doing all their talking, the, the, the movie stars and Snoop Deputy Dog and all these other folks who are talking to us all the time. He says, basically, you are those folks who stand between. God's looking for men to stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. And you got to ask yourself, are you willing to stand in the gap? Are you willing when it's unpopular, when folks don't appreciate it, when they're calling your names, when they're telling you you're old-fashioned, old fuddy duddy out of style, irrelevant, reading this old antique book? Are you willing to stand in the gap and no matter what they say, you stand for the Lord? As the Apostle Paul said to the brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 58, be steadfast, be steadfast, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Are you willing to do that? Because if you are, the times will come when you will have to expose those things that are wrong and you'll have to stand. I call something, I say that, I call it the leader's pledge because leaders have to realize that they have to do this. You say, I trust, I trust the word of God because the word of God is from God himself. It is God breathed and it's my letter from home. I stand unmovable, I stand steadfast, I stand in the way that the Lord has placed me and I make a difference between the holy and the profane. I walk by faith and not by sight. Make not my decisions by those things that are popular and polled and those things that are voted on, but those things that are written in the word of God. I run with patience. The race that is set before me without giving up, I finish that course that the Lord has laid before me. I wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Because I understand that I'm protecting God's people, the greatest people on earth. And my responsibility is to strengthen them, to watch for them, to lift them up, and to protect them. I contend, earnestly contend, and for the faith that has been once delivered. I open God's book, not the books of theology and psychology, not the writings of various theorists and evolutionists, but I open the word of God and I contend for the faith that has been once delivered. I serve with reverence and with godly fear. I give myself as a living sacrifice because I understand that sometimes that because I am God's leader, that I stand in the line of fire to protect God's people. I preach the word, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine because the Lord stood for me and didn't give up and I won't give up on him either. I sing, teaching and admonishing with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, keeping the Lord's church a place of dignity and integrity. I pray without ceasing, with all prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings, because I need to call on my strength, and my help and my strength comes from the Lord. I trust my God, therefore I fight the good fight. I finish my course. I keep the faith, because the Lord will call me to account and to give account of my stewardship, of my shepherdship, of my work, my courage, my sacrifice. Those of you who lead, this letter was addressed to the angels of the church, the shepherds of the church. He says, you got a name that's alive, but you are dead. And he said to those leaders, you strengthen what remains. Those of you who are leaders in the church, I would love to save the whole world. I would love for men to come screaming by the millions, what must I do to be saved? 
I would love for all the folks caught up in illicit lifestyles and perverted lifestyles and preaching false doctrines, I would love for them to come screaming down the road, what must I do to be saved? But you know what? If that don't happen, every person that puts themselves in your periphery and in your shepherdship and in your viewpoint, in your vantage point, God says you better look at them you better listen to them, and you better help them get saved. That's what I told you to do. Don't do what you can't do, but you do what I told you to do. Keep that in mind. You're God's children. When you've heard what is written, and you believe it with all of your heart, you respond. You respond. If you love me that much, Father, yes. You sent your son. Yes, I did. He died on the cross. Yes, he did. He took those nails and beating? Yes, he did. He rose on the third day? Yes, he did. He established that church in Jerusalem? Yes, he did. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm turning myself around. And I'm going to acknowledge to the world that wants to put Jesus' name out of the marketplace. I'm going to stand and loudly proclaim, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe it with all of my heart, mind, and soul. And I'm going to bury my old man, that obstinate, arrogant, disobedient old man in a watery grave so he can stand up again to walk in the newness of life. And if the devil is able to somehow ambush you like the brethren who were overtaken in the fault in the Galatian region, the Lord says, look, you my children. I am not willing that you perish. You come back and tell me that you're wrong. Yes, Father, I'm wrong. That you sin. Yes, Father, I sin. And that you want my forgiveness. Will you please forgive me, Father? I'll forgive you every time I see godly sorrow and a repentant and humble heart. That's who we are. That's who he is. And that's what he promises. Why don't you think about it while we stand? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare.